Anyway, I wanted, on behalf of the university as chancellor, to welcome Professor Sen to give this lecture, and on behalf of the Faculty of Philosophy. Um, many of you will have been participating in the last couple of days in the conference which has been held under the auspices uh, of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative on the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network, which is a bit of a mouthful, but which literally, I think, means um, finding better and more comprehensive ways of defining poverty in order to empower the poor. Um, I'm really pleased that we've been uh, party to that conference, that we've been hosting it, uh, and I'd like again to welcome everybody who's taken part in it, and also to welcome uh, those from the Blavatnik School of Government who have been taking part in a conference on the advancement of uh, good governance in international development. Uh, a subject which I recall we were discussing when I was a Minister for Overseas Development 20 years ago, since when one of the problems has been the necessity of advancing good governance in countries which think they're developed. Um, it is a very great pleasure to introduce Professor Sen, I'm not going to insult your intelligence uh, by uh, reading out his distinguished curriculum vitae, but you will all know that he has held the most prestigious academic posts uh, in India and both sides of the uh, Atlantic, uh, that he is a winner of the Nobel Prize, that he's the author of, I think, 14 books, the last of which he lectured on when he was in this theatre before, The Idea of Justice. Um, and I guess that he's contributed more uh, to the issue of the relationship between economics, poverty, accountability, and pluralism than anyone else in academic or policy-making life. So it's a huge pleasure to uh, invite him to address us today. Uh, after he's spoken to us, um, he's happy to uh, answer questions, and I hope that when he does so, the questions will be uh, shorter than his lecture. Uh, and he's talking to us on uh, discovery of women. Well, I'm very honored and very grateful to be invited to speak here. Uh, having spent 10 years teaching here is also a sense of nostalgia I have. And because uh, I'm particularly honored that the Chancellor himself is able to preside over it. I think he's suffering from the sun at this moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you can move to mine, it's much better. I ought to mention that there's no debate about whether the glass is half empty or half full. <laughs> and so at some stage, if it becomes half empty, that might be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, uh, it's mainly because I sort of run out of steam sometimes. Well, the subject is discovery of women, and I begin with a question. 
why did Mary Wollstonecraft write a vindication of the rights of women after having already written her earlier book, A Vindication of the Rights of Men, with men in the plural, including not only all men, but women as well. There can be no doubt at all that Wollstonecraft included women among the people about whom she spoke in her first book on the rights of men. What appears to have become increasingly clear to her was that there was a strong need to deal specifically with the deprivation of women, its special features and its extensive but often very subtle roots. It was not so much that women awaited discovery, rather there was a need for acknowledgement and understanding, which is not a trivial exercise, of particular problems that afflict women. Some of these problems relate to biology. Mary Wilson Craft herself died of childbirth, which William Godwin, the father of the child, could not have. But these problems mostly relate to the way the society is organized, unlike the biological example, placing women in particular slots with largely determined roles, with rather little freedom or escape. Wilson Craft did make an extraordinarily important intellectual contribution in helping to move the pro-women discussion of those days, I will call it that because it's too early to call them feminist discussion, away from the celebration of the lives of a few successful women who could thrive and excel despite the general barriers against women's progress, to focusing instead on the ways the society keeps women repressed and neglected. Her far-reaching work on the sources of women's deprivation encompassed, among other concerns, the impact of bad or no education, something on which she put great focus, little encouragement to be active in professional or leadership roles, the long reach of the cultivated image of intellectual vacuity, and not least, the tendency to warmly admire women's innocence rather than their creativity. Something needed to be discovered about women, and it's not their existence. Rather, what was, and I believe still is strongly needed, is a better understanding of the conditions governing the lives of women, the opportunities they have or do not have, but also the cultivated images that constrain the ability to think differently on the subject of gender relations. Many of the needed discoveries are neatly packed away in the recesses of the mind. The masculine mind, of course, but even the feminine mind. In fact, a part of the discovery Wollstonecraft showed had to be self-discovery. I will argue that despite the differences in the nature of the economies and societies today, despite political changes and despite political changes such as universal adult franchise, and the changing times, with the internet, Facebooks, and spacewalks, many of the concerns that engage this woman born in 1759 in Spitzfeld in London remain extraordinarily relevant in the very different world in which we now live. Let me begin by relating what I want to say today to a general distinction between two features of human life, namely well-being and agency, which I have tried to explore in the past, and been, been doing it for a long time, beginning with three articles in the Journal of Philosophy in 1985. The distinction corresponds in some ways to the old, in fact, the medieval dichotomy between the, the, between the patient and the agent. The contrast is not only important in itself, it also had very substantial bearing on both the internal and external causal connections related to 
gender equity and inequity. A person's agency aspect refers to the pursuit and realization of goals and objectives um, she has reason to value and advance, whether or not they're connected with her own well-being. A person as an agent need not be guided only by, by how well she may end up being. She may actually choose to pursue other objectives, which could quite possibly be very broad, such as the independence of a country, the elimination of famines and epidemics, or related to the present context, the removal of gender equality in general. Even though there may be some overlap between different objectives, nevertheless, as a general rule, in championing these broader ends, a person may not be primarily influ influenced by the extent to which these general objectives affect her own quality of life or welfare. Our own well-being almost certainly will be among our concerns. Saintliness is not a pervasive and overarching characteristic of humanity, but need not be and typically is not, we know from many empirical, much empirical evidence, the only objective we find reason to pursue. The distinction between agency and well-being is conceptually rich since they refer to two distinct ways in which a person's values, ends, ambition, freedoms, and achievement can be understood using two different perspectives of assessment. As it happens, the distinction is of substantial relevance in general in interpreting practical policies and activities, and in particular in understanding the priorities of social movement Including the, incre including the incre increasingly more active women's movement in many parts of the world. Indeed, until recently, the activities of these movements were typically aimed, at least to a great extent, at working towards achieving better treatment for women, in particular a more square deal. This involved a focus on women's well-being in particular, the choice of this focus had, of course, an obvious rationale, given the way women's interests and well-being had been neglected in the past and continue to be neglected today. It was not only that women's interests were very often neglected, there was an amazing tendency, which had not entirely disappeared, of not understanding what women's assigned roles actually involved. I still remember with saddening amusement, I just arrived at the London School of Economics then, the report produced exactly 40 years ago by an expert committee appointed by the World Health Organization and Food and Agricultural Organization on quote unquote energy and protein requirements for people in different walks of life. Among other categorization, it placed housework, notice that it engaged mostly women, among what it classified as sedentary activities with very low energy requirement. I was not able to determine where the empirical research yielding this diagnosis had been conducted, but the thought that it might have been instant research done in a Manhattan apartment full of gadgets where the com committee was then meeting did cross my mind. The focus on well-being was indeed right, and particularly relevant then, but it was never sufficient. And indeed, in the course of the evolution of women's movement, their objectives have gradually broadened from this quote-unquote welfareist focus towards incorporating and emphasizing the active role of women as agents in doing things, doing things, assessing priorities, formulating projects, agitating about policy change and carrying out programs. Women are not seen in this broadened perspective as recipients of welfare enhancing health brought about by the society, but as active or potentially active promoters and facilitators of social transformation. The changes brought about by women's agency and more generally by the agency of people, men as well as women, concerned about gender justice have been, influence, have been influencing 
of the lives and well-being of women, but also of men and children, boys as well as girls. This has been a momentous enrichment of the reach of women's movement. As far as women's own well-being is concerned, it's also important to take note of the extensive interconnections between the agency aspect and the well-being aspect of women's lives. It's obvious that the active agency of women cannot ignore the urgency of rectifying many social influences that blight the well-being of women and subject them to deprivations of various kinds. Thus, the agency role must be deeply concerned inter alia with, it, with women's well-being as well. Similarly, to consider the other direction of linkage is not only the case that a woman, a woman whose agency is severely restricted will, for that reason and to that extent, be handicapped in well-being as well, but also any practical attempt at enhancing the well-being of women cannot ignore the agency of women themselves in bringing about this change. So the well-being aspect and the agency aspect of women's movement inevitably have substantial interconnections. Despite these connections, however, agency and well-being are two quite different perspectives. Since the role of a person as an agent is fundamentally different from the role of the same person as a patient. It's of course true that any agent may have to see herself, at least to some extent, as a patient as well. For example, the old admonition, admonition physician, heal thyself, is an invitation to the physician to be both an agent and a patient. But this does not alter the additional modalities and responsibilities that are inescapably associated with the agency of a person. An agent has a potentially active and important role in pursuing whatever goals she has reason to support and promote. While these goals would typically include, among other objectives, her own well-being, they can be at the same time far more spacious and extensive in their coverage and include many concerns that are not directly linked with a person's own well-being. The agency role can thus be much broader than the promotion of self-welfare. The changing focus of women's movement towards the agency aspect is thus a crucial and mainly positive broadening and the scope of reach of these movements and involves substantial additions to all the concerns with the well-being of women without denying the continuing relevance of these concerns. The earlier concentration on the well-being of women, or to be more exact, on the ill-being of women and the deprivation that yield that ill-being had, as I have already mentioned, its own rationale. Deprivations in the well-being of women were certainly serious, sometimes atrocious, and their removal is clearly important for social justice. But nevertheless, conceptualizing women's deprivation basically in terms of well-being and thus concentrating on the patient aspect of women cannot but miss out something extraordinarily important about women as active agents of change who can transform their own lives, the lives of other women, and it's important to emphasize the lives of everyone in the society men, women, and children. Since I've been arguing for this kind of broadening of focus from the well-being to the agency aspect of human beings, not just for women, but for men uh, as well, I have a particular reason to appreciate and even celebrate the fact that women's movements as well as feminist literature have both been involved in the recent decade more and more with agency issues. As a consequence, the new agenda has tended to transcend the view of women as patient solicitors of social equity, seeing them instead as harbingers of major social change in making the world a more livable place for all. What I want to ask now is this. Even though the increasing broadening of the perspective of women's activism from the well-being to the agency aspect has been very welcome, is this broadening quite enough? The issues of enlightenment, of critical scrutiny, of re-examination <coughs> of values <coughs> and perception demand much greater understanding 
than Abu Dhabi we have been able to provide, we have been able to provide so far. Um, I say we, because as someone who has been involved with these causes for many decades, and also I might rather boastfully add, as one of the original founders of the journal Feminist Economics, I take the liberty of using we rather than they in this context. <laughs> in a broad way, the need for enlightened scrutiny can in fact be lumped into the concept of agency, very broadly defined as reasoned and informed agency. Having information and agency demand a special position, both because of their importance and because of the common tendency to neglect them. Just as Mary Wilsoncraft perceived the need to write a new book on the rights of women, woman, despite having addressed already the inclusive idea of the rights of men, men very much in the plural. In fact, she ended her second book by denouncing what she rather sharply called, I quote, the privileges of ignore, ignorance, and by championing, quote unquote, the rights of, rights of reason. Agency may come with or without strong reasoning and wide knowledge, and those issues certainly need to be brought explicitly into the picture. Let me illustrate the need for this additional focus by first taking up a classic problem, that of missing women, on which I have written earlier as well. The numbers of missing women can be very large in many parts of the world, especially in South Asia, including India, East Asia, including China, and the Middle East, including Egypt. They reflect how many more women we would have that's how the calculation goes, we would have expected to see in these countries, given the size of the male population, if the female-male ratio in these countries were similar to those countries in which there's no corresponding gender bias against females, at least as far as births and deaths are concerned. There are always gender bias of various kinds, uh, but not at this level. And for example, in Japan, there would be no question of asymmetric treatment of healthcare, nutrition, anything like that, but that's not the same thing as occupying senior positions in business and government. But I meant that kind of gender inequity. The total number of missing women can easily go beyond 100 million, as I discussed in a couple of papers, respectively in the New York Review of Book, which to my pleasure has been widely read, and in the British Medical Journal, which was a more technical paper in the early 90s, which I have to say, I have not seen any great evidence of having been read. <laughs> Taking Sub-Saharan Africa as the point of comparison, since there is relatively little gender bias of this kind uh, in those otherwise challenged countries, very much problematic countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, but since there is no bias of that kind, I took that ratio and People commenting often thought I took the European ratio. I did not. I took sub-Saharan ratio. And those 100 million were generated by using the sub-Saharan ratio and applying it to China, India, the Egypt, and other countries. The correlation behind the shortfall of women was at that time, and the data for those works uh, uh, came, from the 90, came from the 1980s. My paper was way early, I think 92. Um, the excess female, the, the, the causation then was the excess female mortality rate compared with male mortality rates. Given symmetric care in every age group, age group, the female death rate tends to be substantially lower than male in every age group. In fact, it's true even in the uterus. And yet, in these countries, those countries with anti-female bias, the female death rate did not have this lowness, and in fact, for many of these countries, were actually higher uh, for, um, uh, than male death, age-specific death rate, uh, fairly consistently. In the estimates of the early 1990s, the central issue was mortality rate bias. When I did a follow-up study for the British Medical Journal in December 2003, under the title Missing Women Revisited, the overall ratio of missing women turned out to have not changed much, 
little higher in some countries, a little lower in others, not a lot of difference. But the underlying coalition had dramatically shifted. Between the 1980s and the early years of this century, there have been two opposite movements. Female dis disadvantage in mortality has typically been substantially reduced. Say, for example, both in China and India, female life expectancy is a lot longer than male. But this has been counterbalanced by a new female disadvantage, that in natality through sex-specific abortions aimed against the female fetus. The availability of modern techniques to determine the gender of the fetus has made such sex-selective abortion possible and easy, and it is being widely used in many societies. As was noted in the 2003 British Medical Journal essay uh, that, compared, com that compared with the normal ratio of around 94 to 96, so 95 girls, being born for 100 boys everywhere. There are more boys are born than girls. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, since girls do better over a lifetime, the pattern reverses itself. Um, so, so 94, 95 would be the kind of standard. Compared with that, even Singapore and ta Taiwan, Taiwan had 92, South Korea 88, and China a mere 86 girls born per 100 boys. And this is in, in, in the 1993, 92 paper drawing on the, um, uh, the sorry, this is in the 2003 paper uh, did I say, uh, uh, yeah, no, I did say 2003 paper, drawn on just the contemporary data then. Given the incompleteness of birth registration in India, that ratio is difficult to calculate in India. But going by the closely related ratio of females to males among young children below six, and then you can work back with mortality rate, we find that the female-male ratio has fallen from 94.5 girls per 100 boys in the census of 1991, and that is in line with the ratio in Europe and North America, to 92.7 girls per 100 boys in the census of 2001, and in the latest census of 2011, this ratio has fallen further to 91.4. These drops in India may not look particularly high, especially in comparison with China or Korea. But there are further grounds for concern. First, these could be early days, and it's possible that as sex determination, sorry, sex determination of the fetus becomes more standard, the Indian ratio will continue to fall. Second, there are gigantic variations within India, and the All India Average hides the fact that there are several states in the north and the west of India where the female-male ratio for children is very much lower than the Indian average and lower even than the Chinese numbers. There is not, by now very extensive evidence based on inter-country comparison in the world as well as in interstate and interdistrict comparisons within a large and diverse country like India that women's agency, bolstered by great education, greater education and literacy, not only reduce fertility rates, it does it dramatically reducing, for example, in that in Bangladesh, from 7 to 2.2 in the course of uh, two and a half decades. Uh, so it had tremendous effect on fertility rate, and that's a tribute to women's agency, and the total rate of child mortality. But it also reduces sharply the gender bias against females in mortality rates. To the extent that the higher mortality of female children reflect negligence of health requirements for and health-related attention to girls with a boy, women's agency, especially women's educated agency, make things very much better. When young girls have greater voice and receive more attention in family decision, as tends to happen, I'm still discussing mortality, with increased female schooling and the ability of young women to earn an outside income, not only do fertility rates plummet, the lives most affected by over-frequent 
bearing and rearing of children are those of young women, so anything that adds to their voice tends to cut that down. But the death rates of children fall, and so does the discrimination against girls with a revoy in the care that they receive from their family. So here, this is a celebration of women's agency and also a vindication of Mary Wollstonecraft's focus on women's education, closely related to reasoning presented at about the same time by Marquis de Condorcet across the Channel in France. But a difficult issue arises from the shift in the main causation of missing, missing women in the world. With the gains in the removal of mortality differentials against girls being cancelled out by retrogression in natality differentials. Female education, including the education of mothers, does not appear to have a similarly effective role in preventive natality bias to sex selective abortion. Women of childbearing age seem to have, in these affected regions, no less strong boy preference than their husbands or their mother in laws, indeed, sometimes more so. And the education of young women, expanding their agency power, have not statistically had the effect of changing this odd and distressing cultural phenomenon. Fearing that sex-selective abortion might occur in India, the India, Indian parliament was very quick, already in the 1990s, and banned the use of sex determination techniques for fetuses, except when it is a byproduct of other necessary medical investigation. But it appears that the enforcement of this law has been comprehensively neglected. And when questioned by an energetic correspondent of the New York Times, in fact, Celia Daga, the police cited difficulties in achieving successful prosecution thanks to the reluctance of mothers to give evidence of, of use of such techniques, especially since it was generally that they had part participated in the decision. I do not believe that this need not be an insurmountable difficulty in bringing about the law to be enforced. Other types of ed evidence can in fact be used for prosecution. But the reluctance of the mothers to give evidence brings out perhaps the most disturbing aspect of this natality inequality, to wit, the boy preference that many Indian mothers themselves seem to have. This aspect of gender inequality cannot therefore be removed at least in the short run, by the enhancement of women's empowerment and agency, since that agency itself is an integral part of the cause of natality inequality. Indeed, there's clear evidence that traditional routes of changing gender inequality through using public policy to influence female education and female economic participation may not serve at all as a path to the removal of this natality bias. A sharp pointer in that direction comes from countries in East Asia, which all have high levels of female education and economic participation. Despite this achievement, a very large part of East Asia suffers from low to very low ratios of girls to boys at birth. It was very low indeed in South Korea, despite the excellence of women's education there probably among the best in the world. And the government had to use special appeals and pro-women advocacy with some success to make the ratio go up towards European levels. And in China, it still remained drastically low, despite the huge progress made by Chinese women in almost all fields of activity. Which is why, despite its largely successful battle against high mortality of girls, the overall ratio of missing women in China today is not materially different from what it was two decades ago in the bad old days of the 1980s with mortality disadvantage of girls, but little use then of sex-selective abortion of female fetuses. This is, I would argue, exactly where another layer of wilson Garth's argument, very often overlooked, become relevant. She was arguing for greater female education, but also for the need for paying attention to the way traditional values 
are developed, driving into people's head a strong belief that women are inferior in critically important ways to men. Her emphasis on the role of the media and on the part played by the modalities of public discussion is particularly relevant here. She was on the one hand pointing to the role of an established culture which may diminish women compared with men and on the other side she was pleading strongly for public reasoning that would bring, bring out and expose the hollowness of these established presumptions. She ended her letter to Talleyrand, to whom her book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, is dedicated and addressed by reaffirming her strong confidence in relying on public reasoning. I quote from Wilson Craft, I wish, sir, to set some investigation, Talleyrand is in France, yeah, I should explain, of this kind afloat in France should they lead to a confirmation of my principles, when your French constitution is revised, the rights of women may then be respected, if it be fully proved that reason, reason calls for disrespect and loudly demands justice for one half of the human race." Unquote. Mary Wilson Cast believed that these established convictions may reflect nothing more than what she called the privileges of ignorance remained deeply relevant in South Asia, East Asia, and Middle East today, as does her championing of the rights of reason. This is surely a part of agency, we accept that, but not just agency of any kind. Central to that is the powerful perspective, much encouraged during the dynamic days of European enlightenment, that it is enlightenment and particularly enlightened agency to which have to, we have to look for solutions to many problems that exist at any point of time, including now. This applies even to the region, um, regional uh, divide in India. Uh, the fact that all the states in south and east of the country, from Kerala to Assam, have higher gender ratios at birth. Um, then, now where did I, I change pages there? Every state, then every state in the north and west from Punjab and Haryana to Gujarat and Maharashtra. It's a remarkable divide. We have in our forthcoming book a map that cuts India like a sword, going from Assam uh, below it all the way to Kerala and the above territory. One is green, one is red, so it's not hard to miss. It's a little like my driving test. When I, was, I went to renew my driving test, they said, no, we have to give you a driving test before we can renew uh, your license because you're more than 75. And I, and I said, okay, so how, how long will it take? He said, well, you come here. And there were two, there was, I put my eyes, and there was a green uh, background and a red uh, circle in the middle. And he said, what color is the background? I said, green. And he said, what color is the, is the circle? I said, red. And she said, yeah, you're past it. And <laughs> so, so it's that easy, actually. Um, in fact, the southern and eastern states, and this is important to recognize because of the average of India being pulled down so much, all appear to have female ratio, female-male ratio, at birth still that fall within the European range of values. In fact, if you take Italy, uh, the European range varies, but if you take Italy, Spain, Greece average, uh, that comes to about 94, and all the states in the east and south fall in that category, with one exception, or is slightly below, but it's still above some of the uh, European states, including Ireland, which is uh, 93.5. On the other hand, there is none in the north and west which are uh, uh, above 92, so that they really are deficit down. Now, why? We don't know. This extraordinary divide is an important cultural phenomenon, and while the causal pattern behind this dichotomy is hard to identify, the northern and western states would seem to have a much stronger need for an appropriate pursuit of public reasoning in this field. In other fields, necessarily. Now, 
how am I doing for time, Chris? Uh, Five. Five? Okay. <laughs> so I'll give a couple, couple of other examples then of my point. But this one is a more complex example because it, it, it involves so many mother's decisions and so on. These are examples where women's agency have made a big difference and yet have remained blind to certain respect. That's the point I'm trying to make. Consider Bangladesh. It had an impressive advancement in social achievement recently, and its success has drawn heavily on the agency of women. Despite its per capita income being only half of India's, it has overtaken India in terms of many social indicators. Bangladesh's life expectancy is now three years longer than India's, whereas 20 years ago it was three years lower. Its child mortality rate is 25% lower than India's. It's close to full immunization of all children, with India has barely reached 60% coverage. There are a much higher proportion of girls in school than in India. Indeed, many gender-related indicators are incomparably better in Bangladesh than in India. For example, women's participation rate in workforce is almost twice as high in Bangladesh as in India, 59% compared with 33% in India. This, along with greater female literacy and education, is recognized across the world as a powerful contributor to women's empowerment in general. And Bangladesh gives a very good example of that, which has made great use of this avenue of change. In, that field of, in the field of elementary education, Bangladesh has made remarkable strides towards gender equity, so much so that school participation rates and literacy rates of Bangladeshi girls are now marginally higher than those of boys, in contrast with India, where substantial gender bias against girls persists. In the Bangladesh, it turned out, is now the only, is one of the very few countries in the world, in fact, seems like almost unique, in having more girls in school than boys. To what extent women's agency and gender relations account for the fact that Bangladesh has caught up with and even overtaken India in many crucial fields during the last 20 years called for further investigation, which we do try to provide. There's a book coming by my collaborators, Ron Dres and myself. It is a Shakespearean title, I better warn you, taken from two gentlemen in Verona. It's called An Uncertain Glory. And the subtitle is more revealing. It says India and its contradictions. So we discuss the contact between Bangladesh and India in some detail. But it certainly looks like a very important factor in this contrast in the light of what we know about the role of women's agency in development. For example, the fact that both female literacy and women's participation in the workplace play an important role in demographic transition from how low uh, from low mortality and fertility rate is uh, from low mortality, uh, uh, sorry, from high to low mortality and high to low fertility rates is fairly well established. And in every field of public delivery, women's involvement is much greater in Bangladesh. Bangladeshi female male ratio, what we've been talking about, is well into the European range, indeed toward the middle to top of that range, like. Um, uh, uh, 97.2. In my joint work with Ron Dres, we discuss how it is women's agency, indeed more enlightened agency, that has played a big part in Bangladesh's rapid progress over the last two decades. So that is enlightenment too. There's agency, there's education, and there's enlightenment. And yet that enlightenment does not seem to have taken note of the huge danger to which Bangladeshi women um, uh, in which Bangladeshi women work in completely insecure buildings with many accidents in recent years, including the gigantic one recently in Rana Plaza. The fact that these have not been matters of public discussion at all is amazing because everything else has been, um, including the absence of toilets in South Asia where India and Bangladesh had similar, 50% how, without toilet. Bangladesh is now only about 4% without toilet. So I think there's where these were public debates, but as Mary Wilson Clark pointed out, you get those things which you discuss. You have to get it in the public arena. 
Um, the fact that women's movement had moved into issues with a protesting voice is extremely welcome. Now moved into the issue after these accidents. But one only wishes that it, it was not necessary for this exercise in class public reasoning to be fostered by actual accidents and deaths of women who have done so much to change Bangladesh. The other example is, comes from the Indian uh, case recently, particularly about the rape situation in, uh, in, on the 16th of December. Of the enough, it's the Independence Day in Bangladesh, but that's the terrible day on which this gang rape took, took place, and there was followed by huge public agitation. Now, it's wonderful that that agitation took place, and there will be something done. But we have to see what is it that we are talking about. There's one thesis that India has enormously high rates of rape, as indeed one of the papers describes India as the rape capital of the world. The, another issue that is something to do with governance, and there is also issue, is it an urban society? There was a claim that it happens only in India rather than what's called Bharat, traditional India in the rural areas. But they, these things are very easy to uh, disprove, actually, uh, you know, the rape of Dalit women, formerly untouchable women, has been a major phenomenon in the rural areas. So these things don't stand up. But what about the frequency of rape, since I'm often asked a question on that? Now the Indian newspaper, which used not to report rapes at all, and that's a very important issue here, now have turned themselves into rape reporting newspapers. So you read about three or four pages of rape uh, drawn from across the country, which is a good thing, uh, especially as a compensation from the past neglect, before you get to other news, like what Obama said, and so on. So I think that is a change, and it's a very positive change. But if there's so many rapes to report, well, there must be a high frequency of rape. But you know, India is a very large country, and, and, and rape continues to go on in every country in the world. So we have to see what is the rape problem we are looking at. It actually is possible that India's terrible fear failure does not lie in the high rate of rapes at all. Indeed, if we go by the rate of police recorded rape, and these will need correction, I'll come to that. The UN figures give the incidence of rape in India for 2010 as 1.8 per 100,000 people, one of the lowest in the world, compared, for example, with 27.3 in the USA, as opposed to 1.8, 28.8 in the United Kingdom, 63.5 in Sweden, and 120.0 in South Africa. India's recorded number is certainly a huge underestimate. But even if we take 10 times that figure, the corrected number of rapes would still be lower in India than USA, UK, Sweden, or South Africa, even with the assumption that there is no underreporting in these countries. We cannot be sure whether India has a special rape problem or not. But all the evidence suggests that India has a huge problem with making rape a seriously monitored and reported issue, with all that implies about the lack of preventive planning. India's problems can well lie consistently with what we know, not so much with an extraordinary frequency of rape, but with having an uncaring police, bad security arrangement, and unfunctioning judicial system and ultimately an uncaring society. India does not have to be the rape capital of the world for it to be severely indicted. What's also clear is that Delhi has a very special problem that may not apply to other mega cities in India. The rate of recorded rape per 100,000 people is 2.8 in Delhi, compared with 1.2 in Mumbai, 1.1 in Bangalore, 0.9 in Chennai, and 0.3 in Calcutta. Since there's nothing to indicate that the recording of rape is much more efficient in Delhi than in other cities, it is indeed remarkable that Delhi has a record that is more than nine times worse than in Calcutta. Indeed, no matter how friendly to women the Indian society might or might not be, 
There is no reason why Delhi cannot even come close to making the city at least as safe as some of the other cities of India already are. The problems of administration, policing and trials and social indifference remain large for India as a whole. But there are many parts of India that have bigger problems in the security of women than other parts. So what we need in the public discussion are exactly that. The regional variations, like in the case of the female-male ratio, uh, the variations um, also uh, in the, um, uh, in the, in the re re reporting of rape as it becomes an issue because it suddenly jumped up. And I, I think it will become five or ten times, but it will still be lower than <laughs> most countries that you can think of. And I, there is also a couple of issues that are not discussed, the, the issue of, of rape within the family. Most of the rapes uh, uh, take place within the family, including marital rape, unwilling wife being, there's no, marital rape is not regarded as a criminal offense in Indian penal code at all. So these are the issues to go. So I think what I'm pointing out here is that women's agency and enlightened agency can make a difference. I'm really cutting it down because I do want Q&A. Um, but we have to, it has to be based on really serious research. And it seems to me a good subject for, to talk on in Oxford, <laughs> namely that it is ultimately research understanding of what the position of gender bias and women's security is. That could, for reasons that Mary Wilson Craft discussed, could make a real change in India and as though their agency alone would not be sufficient if the enlightened agency aimed at what it is that we have to change uh, is really important. Thank you very much. <laughs>